last 63 days we saw the city blazes. We knew that we cannot possibly win. An army of ordinary citizens fighting the Nazis to save their city. The battle went from street to street, from house to house, day and night. The Americans and the British left them on their own. There was a sense of frustration and injustice that was quite, quite strong. Their loss was catastrophic. But their story was never told. Somehow in history books there's very little of it. Thousands and thousands of people that died in the name of freedom, in vain. D-Day, the Normandy invasion, the turning point in World War II. But all the sacrifice and promise of D-Day would only lead to bitter disappointment in one occupied country in one war-torn city, a city caught between the Nazis and global politics and allied tension. Welcome again to CNN Presents. I'm Aaron Brown. The 1944 Warsaw Uprising. It was one of the most heroic and tragic battles of the Second World War, and yet it is among the least well-known. In the summer of 44, the people of Warsaw, buoyed by the Allied invasion to the west and the Soviet advances from the east, took up what little arms they had and struck back boldly at the Nazis. The resistance fighters, men, women, even children, were virtually on their own, fighting impossible odds, fighting, dying, and waiting for help that never arrived. Their 63-day struggle, their doomed attempt to liberate Warsaw. That story now from CNN's David Ensor. It looks today the way it did for centuries. The old town of Warsaw, capital of Poland, had to be rebuilt, building by building, brick by brick. Sixty years ago, it was reduced to a smoking ruin. Its people killed or banished. Its buildings incinerated in a rage. Hitler had ordered his troops to flatten the city. Over 80% of it was destroyed. Warsaw had dared to rebel against Nazi rule, its citizens fighting the vastly more powerful German army. They were ordinary people, volunteer soldiers, many of them merely teenagers. I was the leader of the youngest groups, under 16, they were used actually for spying. For that, you could obviously go to concentration camp and be shot on the spot. We were young, we were optimistic. It didn't occur to me ever that I can uh, get killed. Or, <laughs> or uh, The only thing I was afraid of was being tortured. They fought against impossible odds. But you couldn't tell them that. You know, the passion with which we participated in all those things was probably difficult to understand to people who never lost freedom. And we had this terrific faith that we are going to be free. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Poland's ordeal began September 1st, 1939. Poland and the world learned the meaning of a grim new word, Blitzkrieg. Hitler's forces charged across Poland's borders in the infamous Blitzkrieg. And World War II began. I saw these huge planes, German planes, and they were black with these crosses on it. And they were flying very, very low, I guess, to escape the anti-aircraft but uh, the trees just started bending down, and I was terrified. 
Julian Kolsky was just a boy when he saw German troops enter a town square where there was a synagogue. And they brought in the orchestra and they started playing German tunes and hoisted the swastika. And then they got the rabbi and tied him up to the synagogue and uh, uh, put the synagogue on fire. And this sort of thing you don't forget, whether you're 10 years old or 100 years old. It was horrible. They closed down your school. They closed down the newspaper. And no concerts. A city that was known for loving music suddenly went dead. No sound. The city of Warsaw was under German occupation for five long and brutal years. During that time, an entire government operated underground with its own legal system, schools, even newspapers. Its underground army trained battalions and gathered weapons, preparing for the day when it would rise up against the Nazis. The scale and the um, the horror of, of those five years of German occupation of Warsaw, I think, are unparalleled. Norman Davies, an Oxford historian who has written a new book about the Warsaw Uprising, says Hitler saw Poland as a laboratory for his racial theories. Jews were herded into a ghetto. Other Poles were rounded up in manhunts to be sent to Germany for slave labor. Warsaw citizens responded by joining the underground army, known by Poles as the AK. Christine Yaroshevich, at 19, was an underground courier. There was a code word that I used, and people opened the door to grab the documents, and I was gone, you know. Underground operations ranged from killing German soldiers to blowing up trains to acts of rebellion that simply lifted the Polish spirit. Nazi punishment was swift and terrible. Public hangings, mass executions. For every German soldier shot by Poles, 100 civilians were killed. You know, for retaliation, the Nazis were executing, taking people hundred people from the streetcars stopping and methodically counting 98, 99, 100 and machine gun on the spot in front of the streetcar. In one of those operations, I was 103rd. Inside the ghetto, conditions were worse. People starved in streets littered with corpses. SS soldiers shot Jews at random. I mean, as bad as things were outside the wall, the inside the wall was incredible. Jews in the ghetto began to be sent to death camps. In 1943, they fought back. The ghetto uprising lasted a month and ended in tragedy. 40,000 either dead or deported to death camps. Nothing left but burnt hulks of buildings. Between Laub and Cherbourg in Normandy, the Allied lightning strikes. By the summer of 44, the war had started to turn. The D-Day invasion of Normandy brought U.S. and British forces onto the continent. Stalin's Red Army, now allied with the U.S. and Britain, was defeating the Germans in battle after battle marching west towards Warsaw. To the thousands in the underground, waiting for five years to strike, the time seemed right. The premier of the Polish government in exile, Stanisław Mikołajczyk, traveled to Washington to gain President Roosevelt's support for an uprising. The president created the climate where uh, the Poles and the Polish underground felt that they had the full support of America and of the British. 
But it was also necessary to gain the support of the Soviet Union, Poland's neighbor and a longtime adversary. Roosevelt urged the premier to fly to Moscow to work it out with Stalin. Stalin is a good friend of mine. He'll be quite reasonable. Um, uh, and everything will be, be fine. He, uh, Roosevelt actually said to the Polish pr Prime Minister, your country will emerge from this war undiminished. If Roosevelt told the, the head of the Polish government in exile that he needn't worry about the Russians, he was being disingenuous. Unbeknownst to Poland, Roosevelt and Churchill had made a deal with Stalin. At the Tehran conference the year before, the big three met for the first time. Eager to placate Stalin and keep him in the war, Roosevelt had agreed that more than a third of Poland's territory would go to the Soviet Union. And that's the occasion when he tells Stalin, in effect, I know you're going to be in control in Poland and Eastern Europe after the war, and I will not disturb your sphere of influence there. So that bargain is struck. In Warsaw, where they knew nothing of such a bargain, the underground prepared to fight. The Polish premier had no firm commitment for help from Stalin, but Moscow radio broadcasts urged Warsaw citizens to rise up. The Russian army was exactly at the gate of Warsaw. We felt, as soldiers in the underground movement, that this was the time to strike. The Allied victory in Normandy fueled their hopes. And we believed so much in, in, in the West. And we thought, now they are with us. We are going to win. The Allies are going to win this war. We now return to Warsaw Rising, the forgotten soldiers of World War II. August 1st, 1944, 5 p.m. The hour set for the Rising to begin. The citizen soldiers of Warsaw couldn't wait. And you arrive in this fantastic big square, and there are thousands of Polish soldiers, you know and there are flags uh, all around, and uh, it was incredibly happy feeling. As dusk fell, the underground fighters took to the streets. To their leaders, the timing was critical. The Russians were close enough to help, but it would be Poles who would liberate Warsaw. We wanted to free Warsaw ourselves. This was our city, our capital, our country. These images of the fight in Warsaw, rarely seen outside Poland, were filmed by the underground. The underground army had about 40,000 fighters. Barely a quarter of them went into the battle with a weapon in their hands. But they had no heavy artillery, no armor, uh, nothing to compare with the uh, huge range of things the Germans had. So you had the striking force and then there were followers who were waiting for you to be shot, wounded or killed, so they could pick up your weapon and go ahead. Some of the insurgents were uh, armed with stones. Many of the weapons they did have were homemade. Flamethrowers fashioned from garden hoses. Grenades made from German bombs. I got a gun which was uh, 
buried in 1939 by the Polish army. It was full of rust, so the first time I fired the damn gun, it almost killed me because it fired back. <laughs> My eye almost lost an eye. But after that, it worked fine. Civilians joined in, building barricades. Even children helped, small enough to run below the guns on German tanks. 10, 12-year-olds would crawl up and blow up a tank or set it on fire with a gasoline bottle. Two tanks were actually captured by the insurgents, the only two tanks they were to have. Wacław Mitsuta, a veteran of the Polish cavalry, took command of the captured tanks. I trained at least two teams, and in two days we were ready to fight. Mitsuta would stage one of the most daring and memorable attacks of the entire uprising. His target, a concentration camp that existed in the remnants of the Jewish ghetto. It was thousands and thousands of Jews which were either killed there or sent to be killed elsewhere. It was a death camp. Mitsuta asked his commander for permission to attack but was told the camp was too well fortified. They would all be killed. And our fellows, they were young fellows and girls too, girls and, and, and men. They were this in their blood and they said, no, we want to attack. Mitsuta asked if he could take a band of volunteers and one tank. Granted permission, they took the Germans by surprise, storming a 10 foot tall wall that surrounded the camp. Mitsuta and his soldiers let loose with the tank's gun. Boom, finished. Another one, boom, finished. And the boys running like mad. Mitsuta and his soldiers liberated the camp. Inside were several hundred Jews, emaciated, expecting death at any moment. They found out that this is liberation. And, my God, it was very emotional, very emotional. There was an old Jew, you know, who came and put on his knees, and he cried, and he thanked us. What do you do? They were brothers, they were sisters. They, for me, there was the, I, I never thought that they are Jews. I thought that they are poor people, you know, who are in, in tremendous, tremendous emotional situation. Moving into an inner courtyard of the camp, Mitsuta saw a remarkable sight. But at the end, there were a group of prisoners. My God, my God. I, I approached them, and there was one with military training, because in a good Polish language, he said, and they written, I give you the Jewish battalion ready to fight. Mitsuta became their commander, the first Jewish unit of the underground army, a unit he says was always at the forefront of the battle. And they were fighting like mad. I think three of them survived. The first days of the uprising cost the Poles dearly. Thousands died. And the Germans held on to most of their strongholds. Still, the Polish flag flew in the city center for the first time in five years. The Polish national anthem, which could not be heard for uh, five years, now is being played. The Polish flags were flying from every house. The Times of London would write, the first of the martyred cities of Europe to suffer the horrors of German air bombardment and of national socialist rule is also the first to see deliverance at hand. 
we now return to CNN Presents Warsaw Rising. By August 3rd, the citizen army of Warsaw had actually gained ground against the Nazi war machine for almost three days. The Germans counterattacked in force, unleashing planes, tanks, and artillery. In a fury, Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler ordered that Warsaw be made an example for all of Europe. Every inhabitant, man, woman, and child, should be killed. People were massacred in cold blood. And the SS simply stormed into the hospitals, turned all the patients onto the street and machine gunned them. Defenseless civilians were herded in front of Nazi tanks as human shields. And we had to fire. When we started firing at the tanks, they would run over the civilians in front of them. Americans should realize we're talking about a tragedy where the same number of civilians were killed every day for 60 days who were killed in the World Trade Center. The Poles hoped that they would only have to hold out for a few days, that their Soviet allies just across the Vistula River would come to their aid. But the guns of the Red Army had fallen silent. And all of a sudden, dead silence. I said, what happened? Where are they? Why aren't they fighting? At this point, the Germans took back the initiative. Their goal? To cut an artery through the center of Warsaw to the river. The fiercest battle raged in the old town. Medieval streets, um, narrow corners, ideal cover for, for snipers and uh, the underground fighters, uh, took the, uh, the Germans a month to capture. 600 underground companies, 50 to 100 soldiers each, fanned out, each with a street or building to defend. When they lacked weapons, they fought with stones or bricks. And through it all, a remarkable underground support system. Bakeries and basements. Factories turning out grenades even underground newspapers. Hospitals were set up in cellars and moved from building to building to escape the German bombs. And this is all your neighborhood. Imagine that, your neighborhood turning to rubble. And you still refuse to give up. And you look at the sky and you say to yourself, oh, the Americans are coming. The Americans are coming because they're fighting for the same thing. But among the Allies, a different kind of battle was going on. The RAF had flown some airdrops to aid Warsaw. But too many planes were shot down. The US wanted to send high-flying, heavy bombers, flying fortresses that could evade German anti-aircraft fire. But the planes would have to land in Soviet-controlled territory to refuel. In a series of historic telegrams, the U.S. asked Stalin for permission to land. Stalin refused. They not only watched the Nazis massacre the insurgents and kill a lot of the civilian population, but they prevented for many weeks us, the Americans and the Brits, from delivering help to the insurgents. Stalin had his own plans for Central Europe when the war was over, and an independent Polish government wasn't part of it. The fact of the matter is that Stalin did not want to see Warsaw liberated by the Poles. He would prefer to see it smashed. The Soviet refusal launched a crescendo of telegrams between Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin. August 20th. Churchill and Roosevelt send a joint message to Stalin urging him to let their planes land. August 22nd, Stalin responds with a denunciation of the handful of criminals in Warsaw. August 25th, Churchill asks Roosevelt to join him in another impassioned plea to Stalin. 
To Roosevelt, he proposes to send the planes and see what happens. It is at this moment that Roosevelt makes a fateful decision. August 26th, Roosevelt to Churchill. I do not consider it advantageous to the long-range general war prospect for me to join you in the proposed message to Uncle Joe. Roosevelt's refusal to act is probably the key political moment in the Rising. The Western Allies had a lot of cards they could have played. They were supplying the Soviet Union with colossal amounts of transport, ammunition, military supplies. And if the president had intervened, he may well have had a response. They never even tried it. Whether the effort would have succeeded, whether Stalin would have backed down, we'll never know. What we do know is that Roosevelt wouldn't even support Churchill in some half-hearted efforts to put pressure on Stalin. But Roosevelt was preoccupied with beating the Nazis on the Western Front. And he knew that the Soviets had so far borne the brunt of the battle against the Germans. He did not want to risk losing them. This is very much on Roosevelt's mind, that he cannot really afford to antagonize the Soviet Union in any way. The basic strategy of the United States was to fight a war of attrition where most of the attriting would be done by the Soviets. And indeed, uh, the Second World War took over 20 million Soviet lives. It took fewer than half a million American lives. Later historians would call Stalin's refusal to help the Poles a gauntlet thrown down before the West. When Stalin sensed that there wasn't really too much pressure from Roosevelt, from Churchill, I suspect he simply became more brazen. In late August, news of the Allied liberation of Paris reached Warsaw. To the desperate Poles, it was bittersweet. We were very happy uh, on one hand and, uh, and feeling alone on the other. And we were really beginning to understand that we are left alone and that we are not going to win. We now return to Warsaw Rising, the forgotten soldiers of World War II. The battle for the Old Town took 33 days. One building changed hands seven times. The battle went from street to street, from house to house from floor to floor, day and night. At the peak of the battle, German bombers arrived every 40 minutes. Casualties were enormous. Many Polish units lost 80% of their soldiers. There was no way of surrendering. They would murder you. They would, they would not take prisoners. There wasn't no much sleep. There wasn't much food, and slowly there was not much hope. Facing obliteration, underground commanders decided to evacuate the old town to get to the city center for a last stand. Their only method of escape, the sewers. Yes, the sewers was an um, extraordinary story. It became an everyday occurrence of thousands of people moving uh, under German positions very often. For five days, underground units staged diversionary attacks to distract the enemy. Meanwhile, directly underneath them, thousands of unseen men and women were escaping through the sewers. The last group just 50 yards ahead of the oncoming Germans. What I saw in front of me for six hours was the behind of the man in front of me. 
we had constantly moved. If somebody would fail to move or pass out or or die of an exhaustion, we would be there bottled up for the rest of our, our life. The Germans tried to stop it by dropping um, grenades and gas canisters and quite a lot of people were killed in the sewers. Several thousand made it through to the city center. Throughout the slaughter, the Soviets remained on the sidelines. Except for an attempt in mid-September to cross the Vistula River by a Polish unit under Soviet command. It was brief, unsuccessful, and never repeated. What's more, the underground was receiving disturbing reports that outside Warsaw, the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, were actually arresting their soldiers. Some of them shot, others shipped to the Gulag. The NKVD was staging Nazi-like hunts, chasing the underground in all the provinces the Soviets were taking over. From the Soviet point of view, they were not just anti-Nazi fighters, which they were. They were people who wanted an independent Poland. That made them objectively, in Soviet eyes, anti-Soviet. So they would destroy them, and they did. And those reports were getting back to London and Washington, were they not? Yes, and they were disregarded. Because they were? Politically inconvenient. And the underground was having difficulty getting London to believe their desperate situation. And this is an ID do document. Sofia Korbonsky yes. was a decoder yes, for the underground radio. Or you were giving them reports? Every day. You were telling them the fight was still going on? Everywhere. Ev every day. 18 hours a day. On September 1st, the fifth anniversary of the German invasion of Poland, with thousands of his people dying in the streets of Warsaw. The exiled Polish commander-in-chief abandoned diplomacy, writing an open letter in London newspapers. Warsaw is not waiting for empty words of praise, not for assurances of sympathy. Warsaw is waiting, Warsaw is waiting for weapons and ammunition. We now return to CNN Presents, Warsaw Rising. September 18, 1944 was a beautiful day in Warsaw. The sun was shining. Suddenly, in the sky, a miracle. That was the most wonderful picture when the American planes came and uh, they were very, very high, so you didn't see anything. You just had this, mm, you know, these heavy bombers. And then all of a sudden there was like flowers. The parachutes were multicolored, you know. The Soviets had finally relented. U.S. flying fortresses had been granted clearance for a mission to aid Warsaw. It was a spark of hope, but a false one. 
It was the one and only American mission the Soviets would clear. By now, the Polish resistance had been reduced to three shrinking pockets. In one of them, Mokotów, the insurgents under a torrent of artillery and bombardment, were driven into a block of barricaded streets. We were totally exhausted. We were starving. We had no ammunition. We were going to go to the center of the city, which was still in Polish hands. And the only way we could do it was to go through the sewers. So began a trek that was truly a descent into hell. Civilians and soldiers alike crowded into the sewers. Many of them became psychotic, paranoid. They were screaming. There was uh, dead bodies of people who exhausted and gave up or died or even committed suicide because they could not carry on. For 20 hours, men and women walked in a river of human waste, sometimes up to their chests. And uh, I think that I sort of imposed upon myself not to think, don't think, don't think because you will, you will not make it, you know. I think that the one thing that saved me from losing my mind was that I had an illusion of a light at the end. And then suddenly I realized there is a stream of light that was coming down through the manhole, and suddenly I was the next one. Somebody grabbed me under my arms and put me down, you know, put me on my feet. Christine Yaroshevich made it, but went blind for three days from the fumes of the sewers. Janusz Belza also survived after watching many others die. After all these hours, you know, and feeling that you arrive into kind of a safe area and the helping hands to getting you out. While the remaining insurgents converged on the city center, to the west, the Germans were arresting and shooting underground survivors. Shockingly, to the east, the Soviets, supposed allies of the Poles, were doing the same thing. Reports of Soviet behavior were, finally, getting out. In London, the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Anthony Eden, faced outraged members of parliament. Does the right honourable gentleman think that there is anything to be gained by covering up the fact that an ally of ours is both deporting and shooting nationalists and socialists in Poland? By late September, the underground could no longer go on. Starvation was setting in. People were drinking from puddles. Every dog and horse in the city had been eaten. There was nothing to eat. I was hunting cats. After 63 days of fighting, on October 2nd, it was over. Realizing that help from the Soviets was a lost cause, underground leaders surrendered and agreed to evacuate Warsaw. Nearly three quarters of the underground army had perished. Those who survived remember the surrender well. It was the worst moment of my life to be surrounded by Germans and taken back into captivity after two months of freedom. Despair. Despair. But we knew that the road ahead of us is not easy. So you did not allow yourself to sit down and cry. This was considered unpatriotic, and weaklings were doing that, but not us, you know. As the surviving soldiers of the underground army marched out of Warsaw to be deported to POW camps, even the Germans admired their courage. One German officer wrote home, in truth, they fought better than we did.
We now return to Warsaw Rising, the forgotten soldiers of World War II. By the end, well over 200,000 people died in the Warsaw Uprising, most of them civilians. A half million others were driven out as refugees. On Hitler's orders, the city that had defied the Nazis was reduced to rubble. The Soviet generals across the river watched. Nobody had dreamed that the Red Army would be stopped in the suburbs of an Allied capital and would watch that capital being destroyed. But worse was to come. Prime Minister Churchill confers with Premier Stalin in Moscow. Barely ten days after the underground surrender, Churchill traveled to Moscow to meet with Stalin. He brought along Poland's premier in exile, supposedly to negotiate Poland's post-war boundaries with the Soviets. When the Polish premier began to negotiate, as he thought he'd been encouraged to do, Molotov interrupted him and said, what's all this? Uh, Mr. Churchill here settled all these matters at Tehran a year ago. Now, what are you wasting our time trying to negotiate some stupid compromise? And the Polish Prime Minister was absolutely thunderstruck. And he turned to Churchill and said, is that true? And Churchill, according to the minute, hung his head and after a, a brief silence said, yes, it's true. And that was the time when the Poles realized that they really had been sold down the river. Days before, in Washington, President Roosevelt, getting ready for an election just weeks away, posed in front of a map of pre-war Poland with Polish-American leaders. The implication? He would be the protector of Poland's pre-war boundaries. Unbeknownst to them, he had already agreed to cede a third of Poland's territory to the Soviets. Victory in Europe brought wild rejoicing throughout the Allied world as the Big Three announced the downfall of Nazi Germany. The Allied victory in Europe came in May 1945 in the Pacific a few months later. It's a great day as a thankful people let loose them. But Poland remained occupied by Soviet troops, and the underground soldiers who made it to the West were in for a shock. In the victory parades, there was no place for them. The Allies had recognized the Warsaw pro-communist regime installed by Stalin as the official government of Poland. We fought for five years in the underground, but uh, the only ones allowed into the victory parade in London were the Moscow Poles. I remember I was crying in 1946 in London. Units of Fiji were parading and the Poles were not allowed. So and we knew that the whole effort, thousands and thousands of people that died, in the name of freedom, in vain. You cannot help but feel bitter. So our story was forgotten. Forgotten for many reasons. For the Western Allies, the story of the underground fighting for Warsaw alone was an embarrassment. For the Soviets, it was inconvenient. In Warsaw, there would be no official monument erected to the underground fighters until 1989. The end of World War II marked the beginning of 44 long years of Soviet repression in Poland. For many of those who survived it, the story of the Warsaw Uprising is one of betrayal, great powers abandoning a staunch ally. Historians, however, disagree about its legacy. Some say Roosevelt and Churchill went as far as they could pressing Stalin. Given that they counted on his Red Army to keep doing the lion's share of the fighting and the dying. If you ask who won the war, if you mean who paid the greatest price in blood and treasure to defeat Nazi Germany, the answer is the Soviet Union. 
Others say Roosevelt in particular was short-sighted, that the loss of Warsaw paved the way for the tragedy of the Cold War. And I don't think Roosevelt went beyond the notion, let's defeat the Nazis, and that's it. To defeat Nazism while with considerable indifference handing over half of Europe to Stalin was a major compromise of principle, which proved historically costly. There are monuments now in Warsaw, as the last generation of those who fought is dying out. To some, the uprising was about courage in the face of terrible odds. To others, it was naive, even folly. But to those who were there, it was simply inevitable. When you look back on it now with the advantage of history, was it worth it? Always. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was, you know, in accordance with Polish history. It was in accordance with Polish attitudes. It was according with Polish soul and heart. The Warsaw Uprising, though unsuccessful, set a powerful example for future generations. Back in the 1980s, I watched young Poles paint this symbol of the uprising as graffiti during the rise of the Solidarity Trade Union. Their peaceful protest led to the end of communism and a free Polish nation, the one their grandparents fought for back in 1944. For CNN Presents, I'm David Ensor in Warsaw. Good night. CNN Presents brings you the world. Week after week, storytelling that separates fact from fiction. CNN Presents, daring to look below the surface. This is the death chamber. At the most compelling issues of our times. We will remain in Iraq as long as necessary, and not a day more. The award-winning documentary series, CNN Presents, Sunday 8 Eastern on CNN.